This is a response to a video by Kerry McCarpet entitled Eric Weinstein's Geometric Unity Theory and the Portal Effect. This is a weird type of response. Kerry focused, as the title betrays, on Eric Weinstein's sci-fi theory about a technology that will allow people to hack the source code of reality. I may check it out as I like sci-fi just as the next guy. But I'm not really interested in this. Kerry puts nature in a very positive light and she depicts the invention and use of technology as a kind of an original sin. Technology, as Kerry argues, distracts our minds, disconnects us from friends and families and blurs our perception, blinding us to the reality of the world. These are the ideas I want to put to the test. Be sure to check out the links before. You'll find talks and discussions about anarcho-primitivism, saving the planet, a channel devoted to anti-technologism, and of course, Carrie's original video. You really should watch Carrie's video before proceeding further. Now, before going further, I have to make some clarifications. For years and years I've been enjoying Carrie's YouTube videos. In the present video, I'm going to say things that may be interpreted as ugly. But this is an intentional, conscious choice. I want to speak to intellect, but also I want to speak to imagination. It is a literary device, if you will. Nothing else. It is by no means an attack on Kerry. Okay, let's get to it. The first point Kerry is making is that tool use and language are things that alienate us from reality, things that are more than parasites than natural advantages. Bees make nests, termites make nests and mounds, beavers make dams, birds make their nests, and homo sapiens make tools. All of these species, including humans, are fit to make and use their creations. Humans have mental and physical structures to use, understand and make tools. That's the kind of animal we are. We can stand upright to have tools in our hands. We operate these tools with astonishing precision with our hands. We have brains that see the use of objects in the world just as transparently as we see that something is food. We see a sharp stone as something to cut with, that is, a type of a tool or a thing to use, just as clearly as we see an apple as something to eat. It is as natural an instinct as being afraid of spiders. Similarly with language, we evolved structures both in the brain but also in other parts of the body, for example the vocal cords, that allow us to use language. Homo sapiens loses nothing when it is using parts of the brain devoted to language or tools. The organization, both structural and functional, of the brain evolved in such a way as to allow the species to use these two functions. So we certainly don't grow dumber as time in an evolutionary scale progresses. The only reason why other animals have a harder time destroying more life is simply because their tools are smaller. But when beavers bail the dam, millions of animals die in the vicinity. It is not because these animals have evolved some regulatory instincts. Homo sapiens has always been creating tools. What is a bee that doesn't create nests? What is a beaver that doesn't bail dams? And finally, what is a human that doesn't create and use tools. To the above I will just add that if you were to remove from Homo sapiens the capacities for language, tool use, abstract thought, then it would be equal to removing Homo sapiens from planet Earth. Whatever else will be left around, it would not be the same species anymore, not in the slightest. In recent videos, Kerry put emphasis on having a good relationship with nature even to the point where we should be leaving behind our tools and language, as they distract us and corrupt our perception of the real. But what do you find in nature really? Now is the time to speak to the imagination. You go through a rainforest, 
you slip up on a wet branch, you break your leg. The damage isn't that big, but bone fragments did cut some muscles. You got an infection, fever sets in, the leg looks bad, it smells bad, the body rots. You wake up in a cold sweat only to see some insects flying above your leg, some sitting on it. With the rest of strength you have left, you cover your leg with dirt, if only to keep the insects away. You pass out again. You feel increasingly restless. You feel scratching. You try to open your eyes. It's day. How long did you sleep? Never mind. Your attention is immediately caught by some weird movement. It's the dirt on your leg. The dirt moves. You shake out of fear, maggots. Maggots are crawling out of your leg. Is this how it ends? Unfortunately, yes. Yes, it is how it ends. When the maggots are eating your flesh from the inside, will it be enough for a connection with nature? Will the pain be enough to connect with how things really are instead of daydreaming about abstractions? If this is not being one with nature, then what is? What is so great in nature that we should strive to connect with it to the point of losing our language and capacity to think? Nature is not just forests, waters, pretty animals and flowers. Nature is brutal. It is a struggle for life, but a struggle that is paid with suffering, pain, fear, disease, death. Millions upon millions of sentient creatures have no way out of this arena. They just come into existence, they have to struggle, suffer and die. That is the other side of the reality of nature. Do not ignore it. The point I'm trying to make here is that Kerry and most people we hear from state decisively that nature is something good, it has intrinsic value, it has to be protected. It is a radically positive outlook on nature. Unfortunately, it is almost always presented without any supporting argument. That is why I am the young to the zine. I have to challenge this notion with a bleak picture of nature to bring the other side to our attention. This is a call to answer to Kerry and other interested people to present a good case explaining why nature, given not only the aesthetic allure but also the grim struggle of living creatures, is something to be cherished and defended at all costs. I'm not sure how I can reconcile the claim that technology, for example TV, makes us depressed and disconnected from reality with the old traditions that Kerry also often refers to. The Four Noble Truths of Buddhism state very clearly that the cause of great suffering and pain is wanting things, desire for stuff and attachment. There is no mention of going back to nature or deep connection with other people, one's family and friends. Quite the opposite, your desperate craving to be one with nature and your attachment to your relationships with people is what makes you suffer. You will never attain your communion with nature. Your relationships with friends will end due to impermanence of all things. All this will bring you and me and us pain. The religious traditions that are closer to us both historically and geographically are the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. I'll make an example out of Christianity as we're most familiar with it. Throughout both Old and New Testaments you see again and again a distinction between the natural world and the heavens. No technology, no distraction can get you as far away from nature as the supernatural. Three days after the crucifixion, Jesus rises from the dead, essentially committing the deepest blasphemy against the natural order that there could ever be. God raises his angry fist into the heavens and punches nature down to break her necklace that connects life and death. This is the ultimate abomination. There is no unity with nature. 
What Abrahamic religions tell us is that we should strive to escape the natural order and to jump to the supernatural. So what is this old tradition that speaks about going back to nature or strengthening relationships with other people that would make the world so blissful? Kerry says that technology brought bad, evil things upon humanity. But what or how was human life 200,000 years ago? Cold, fearful, starved, most children dead before their first birthday, people living around 25 years, full of disease and parasites. There were also some good things, but overall, do you really think that such a world was somehow better just because of some nebulous relationship with nature? You break a leg in a forest, contract a disease and you will spend your last days suffering immensely. This is nature for all wildlife today. I'm not saying that we have it better now, I'm just asking what's the difference and was it that much better? To me, this looks like longing for a time that has never been. Transhumanists look into the future for their technological salvation. Nature purists look into the past for the same. But it seems like what they see there is only their dreams. This worship of nature is becoming more and more common. You may be interested to explore the work of John Zerzan, an anarcho-primitivist who writes extensively on this topic. But even from him, I haven't heard good enough reasons to go back into the Stone Age or how it could ever be accomplished. I hope you found something interesting here. I would very much like to hear your thoughts in the comments. And have a good one.